The word of God says in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. This is the word of the Lord. Now, uh, I know in my life, many times I've prayed this prayer, but have you ever prayed, Lord, would you make me the answer to somebody else's prayer today? Would you make me the answer to someone else's prayer today? You know, uh, let me be the life that intersects with them as they're seeking your face, as they're looking for an answer. Use my hands as the answer. Use my feet to put me in place to be the answer. Use my lips as that encouragement they're seeking you for. Well, it's interesting because though Moses doesn't know it, this is exactly the situation he finds himself in. He's about to be an answer to prayer. In fact, at the end of chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, we, we hear the cries, the groans that are going up to heaven from the Hebrews who are still in the land of Egypt. And here we see God about to use this man Moses to ultimately be the answer to that prayer. Now, we've spent the last two episodes, the last two podcasts, really hanging out in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. And uh, discussing the design of the desert or the wilderness, the midbar, and it's foundational, it's pivotal, it's essential really to understand the whole book of Exodus and, and truly the, the narrative of, of all the scriptures and even how God works in our lives. But as we continue on the journey, I want to now move into another two-part, uh, whatever you want to call it, two episodes, uh, and take on the topic of learning to listen to God in five steps. Learning to listen to God in five steps. Now, note, I did not say learning to listen to God in five easy steps. I just said learning to listen to God in five steps. Um, and this is, again, just something so practical. And yet my prayer is that uh, you and I would be willing to let the Holy Spirit convict us of the things that he wants to change in us and conform into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a great illustration that I heard about... Um, a Native American man, along with his friend, and they were walking in the in the in Manhattan, right near Times Square. And as they were walking right near there, uh, you know, the, all the sounds of Manhattan were going on. I was just there this last week, and let me tell you, it's a loud place. Uh, you got the squealing of taxis and the, the crazy driving happening. You've got the horns, which are incessantly honking. You, you've got the slamming of doors. You've got the walking of people. You've got the, the blasts of various sirens, and it, it, it can be kind of chaotic. But in the midst of all of this, as these two were walking in, uh, this, this Native American man all of a sudden paused, stopped, and said, uh, I, I, I hear a cricket. His friend was sure that he did not hear a cricket, and he said, you know, with all this noise around us, uh, my friend, you don't hear a cricket. You're just imagining it. He said, no, no, I, I definitely hear a cricket. And uh, though his friend thought he was crazy, he kind of followed the sound, walked over to this planter that was on the side of the street and uh, looked inside. And sure enough, there at the bottom of this planter was this small cricket making his chirping sounds. And his friend was quite impressed, said, that's truly incredible. You must have superhuman ears. And the Native American told him, he said, no, actually, my ears are, are no different than yours. It just all depends on what you're listening for. And his friend tried to convince him, saying, no, no, you don't understand. Like, the, the normal ears cannot hear a cricket in the middle of Times Square or in the middle of Manhattan. And he said, no, it really just depends on what you're listening for. And he said, watch this. And so he walked back out to the street. He took some coins. And he dropped these coins right there on the sidewalk. And they made, of course, the clanging sounds that coins make when they all fall at once. And immediately, as soon as they fell, many faces stopped and turned and looked at these coins which had just fallen on the sidewalk near Times Square. And immediately the point was made. He said, do you see what I mean? 
it all depends on what's important to you. It all depends on what's important to you. It all depends on what you're listening for. See, we want to discuss the topic learning to listen to God, learning to listen to God in these five steps. But the reality is that we will listen. We will hear that which we want to hear. And the question truly is, do we want to hear God? And that's what we're going to be wrestling with. Do we want to hear his voice? Um, the paraphrase of the scriptures, the message, uh, says in Psalm 46.10, Step out of the traffic. Take a long, loving look at me, your God. Above politics, above everything. Or in the Amplified Version, we read, let be and be still, and know, recognize, and understand that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. It's interesting that when uh, God, or I should say, when, when God engages Moses in this particular encounter in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is not on some sort of religious quest. He's no, at least not from what we read in the text. Um, he's not on some sort of pilgrimage. He's doing something very mundane. Of course, he's herding his flock, um, pastoring this flock. And uh, so as we think about our mundane, as we think about what's going on in our life, the question is, are we ready? Are we prepared? Um, do we know what the voice of God sounds like? Are we ready to listen to his voice? Um, there's a book that my wife and I have just been reading called uh, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it's, a, um, it's quite a powerful book by John Mark Comer. He says this. He asks a question, do you ever catch yourself with the sneaking suspicion that you'll wake up on your deathbed with this nagging sense that somehow in all the hurry and busyness and frenetic activity, you missed the most important things? Somehow you started a business, but you ended a marriage. You got your kids in their dream colleges, but never taught them the way of Jesus. You got letters after your name, but learned the hard way that intelligence is not the same as wisdom. You made a lot of money, but never grew rich in the things that matter most, which ironically aren't things at all. You watched all 14 seasons of fill in the blank, but never learned to love prayer. Wow. Uh, along with that, um, there was a reference to Philip Zimbardo's research called uh, or on the demise of guys. And if you've watched his TED Talk or read some of what he's written, I'm, I'm not advocating everything, nor am I saying I, I agree with everything. But in part of his research, he, um, he concluded that the average guy in the United States spends 10,000 hours. Do you get that? 10,000 hours playing video games by the age of 21. Now, I don't actually doubt this. I was just speaking at a conference in New Jersey this past weekend. And uh, at one point during one of the breaks, I was walking um, down the rows of seats. And it took me seven rows in to find one guy who was not on his phone during the break. And many of them were gaming right there before the next session. It is an addiction. It is a pandemic among young men and, and also, frankly, among many young women. Uh, but anyway, after those, those statistics were given, um, going back to John Mark Comer's book, he, t he said that his mind jumped the, uh, in thinking about this research. He said, in 10,000 hours, you could master any craft or become an expert in any field. Uh, and he, he, he names various things. You could get your bachelor's degree or your master's degree. You could memorize the New Testament or you could beat level four of call of duty. And how we spend our time is how we spend our lives. It's who we become or don't become. Uh, uh, why did I take that much time to share that with you? Well, I believe that this really comes back to learning to listen to the voice of God is, is going to be a decision. A decision for each one of us to make because the issue is not, is God speaking? The issue is, will we listen or will we hear what he has to say? And praise God, this passage is so clear in giving us instructions on how to hear the voice of God, how to listen to what he wants to say. Now, the, the first point I'm really not going to say much about because it goes back to our discussion on the wilderness and, and the privilege, the blessing that the wilderness plays. But Step number one that we find in this passage for um, hearing the voice of God, learning to listen to the voice of God, is this. We must be alone. 
be alone. Well, when I say we must be alone, it doesn't mean that we always have to be alone to hear God's voice. But what I mean by be alone is not some monastic call, but it is a call to step out of the pace of the world so we can hear the voice of the word. You see, God speaks, but the question isn't only are we listening. The question is, can we hear? Um, I'm not going to go back into the the uh the the discussion on the desert on the wilderness since we spent two episodes on that but just remember that the very word wilderness midbar comes from dabar which is to speak and uh, the meme of course ma- means it's the place of speaking so therefore remember he is in a place alone he is separated from let's say normal life he's in a place of solitude and i just wonder In our life, do we even give ourselves that opportunity? Do we set aside technology? Do we set aside that pace of of work? Do we set aside the, the chaos of relationships and other things in our life to just say, Lord, I want to seek your face. I need to hear from you. Again, God is communicating, but are we taking time to listen, to be alone? This is going to be the place where he hears the voice of God. Actually, if you walk through scripture, you're going to see it's that coming aside where God communicates. Uh, Again, I'm not saying there aren't exceptions, but we see this even in Proverbs chapter 2 when it's talking about searching out the truth of God's word. We're supposed to dig for her like for hidden treasures, that wisdom. And again, hidden treasures, not just things on the surface, but it's that deep dive into scripture. It is that mining. It is that intentionality in the journey. And so to be alone um, and, and just notice even examples like Luke chapter 10 with, with Mary, when she chooses to sit at the feet of Jesus and the Lord says she's chosen the best part. But from being alone, there's a second point we want to discuss, and it's going to be the only other point of the five points that we actually touch on in this particular podcast. So be alone. But the second thing is this, to be alert. Be alert. Look at verse 2. We're told, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Then he looked and beheld, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. All right, let's just pause there. The angel appears, the angel of the Lord appears to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Now, I think we need to talk about this bush for a little while. Uh, I'm not trying to um, give more details than is necessary, but I do believe that as we study the word of God, all of it is uh, profitable, it's beneficial, so in a very real way, it is necessary. But what we're trying to target here is what's necessary for this particular conversation. And for this, we do need to understand a little bit about this bush. Um, Many believe this bush was the wild common acacia thorn bush, but the main thing is understand the word used here in Hebrew to describe the bush um, comes from the word uh, to stick or to prick, meaning a, a thorn bush or a bramble. Now, this is actually significant, so I want you to understand there are thorns. I'm going to come back to this later. There are thorns involved in the story, and it reminds us that God uses little things to to do his work. Um, We would see later on in Scripture he uses the jawbone of a donkey. He uses uh, a slingshot and some smooth stones. He uses... Uh, five five loaves of bread and, and two small fish, as the disciples say, to accomplish his will. And the reality is that he will use uh, you if you're yielded to him as well. And so what an encouragement it is here that this simple thorn bush is being used. But what is unusual in the story? Well, what's, what's not unusual is the fact that there was a bush burning. Um, a bush that burns is a, a fairly... Typical. I'm not going to say it's an everyday, but it's a fairly typical occurrence in the desert. National Geographic on December 5th, uh, 2019, had an article called Here's How Wildfires Get Started and How to Stop Them. In this article, they made mention that 10 to 15 percent of wildfires occur on their own in nature. And then they said this naturally occurring wildfires can spark during dry weather and droughts. In these conditions, normally green vegetation can convert into bone-dry flammable fuel. Strong winds spread fire quickly and warm temperatures encourage combustion. And then it went on to say that heat sources help spark the wildfire and bring fuel to temperatures hot enough to ignite. Now, uh, then it goes on to say lightning, 
burning campfires, cigarettes, and even the sun can all provide sufficient heat to spark a wildfire. You get that? Lightning, um, the sun. These are natural occurrences going on in the wilderness. And so what is the point? The point is that bushes can catch on fire. So a bush that burns would not necessarily be an anomaly. Um, it, it could be a common thing. But notice that there was something out of the ordinary. We, we see it very clearly in verse 2. He looked and behold, the bush was burning yet it was not consumed. Um, we could say, yet it does not burn up. This is in the imperfect tense. And I just wonder, uh, is there something that maybe we think of as normal, but the Lord is trying to get our attention, but we're not paying close enough attention to recognize, hang on, there's something abnormal in what we just perceived as normal. Um, in other words, is, is the Lord trying to get our attention through financial problems, through um, bad health, through a demotion, through some perceived failure, through a person that is all of a sudden in your life or in your path? Um, instead of God trying to get your attention, wouldn't it be wonderful if we would just give him our attention each day, make ourselves available to him, seek his face in, in prayer, seek his face through his word, and allow him to um, teach us to process the events of our life that are around us. I truly believe that we encounter burning bushes on a daily basis, but the question is, do we turn aside to see? And we'll discuss that a little bit later on. What was unusual? Well, I just mentioned the bush continues to burn, um, and this would have definitely sparked curiosity for a, a seasoned shepherd of the Midbar. And the other thing that was certainly an anomaly was the angel of the Lord is appearing to him from the midst of the bush. Now, I am not going to discuss the angel of the Lord much right now at this juncture. I plan to take an entire podcast to discuss the angel of the Lord a little later on. And the reason for that is this is no minor detail. In fact, it's, a, it's an element that will tie together many pieces in the Old Testament scriptures and particularly in the Pentateuch. But with that being said, right now, just kind of set aside the portion of the angel of the Lord. Know that I'm not ignoring it, but I want to actually devote more time to it a little later on. And so these burning bush moments, what are they or how are we using them in this um, discussion? Well, these are the moments of life where we recognize that something supernatural is happening, something beyond the realm of the ordinary. And like Moses, it's something where you say, hang on, I need to take a closer look because what I'm seeing just isn't normal. What I'm seeing has the fingerprints of God on it. What I'm seeing is something which is intended to not only teach me, but probably to even guide me in the way in which I am to walk. And of course, um, these burning bushes are ultimately going to point us back to the Word of God. And let me keep reiterating that. So we're not we're not we're not basing our um, our theology, our doctrine, off of burning bushes that we're seeing. But these burning bushes are going to point us to the message, which is the word of God. Same thing here. This is not about a burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Moses doesn't leave talking about the burning bush. Moses leaves talking about the message that came from the burning bush. And the same thing is true in our lives. So, so what do I mean? What do I mean by these burning bushes of life? Oh, I could give you quite a few examples Um from from just my personal life, I remember back when I was a, a ten year old, and one of my best friends got a, a brain tumor, and he um, this is over in Senegal, West Africa, and he was told that he was going to to die fairly soon, and it was um it, it was painful for us as as his family, his friends watching him from the outside. He started to lose all of his senses, you know, sense of taste, sense of sight, sense of hearing, and uh and, and just very uh, not slowly very quickly, um, he was on his deathbed, and it was obvious he was going to soon go to be with the Lord Jesus. But as he lay in a hospital in Dekar, Senegal, and their hospital wards are many people in the same room, so usually six beds, and there's a lot of people on the floor. You got cats walking around. It's just not the most ideal uh, medical environment. But he was laying on his bed in the midst of many other people, 
and uh, is interesting. Though he couldn't talk, though he couldn't see, though he really couldn't do much, there's one thing he could do. And from his hospital bed, he would sing at a high, passionate voice the songs about Jesus that he had learned after coming to Christ in his teenage years. And I'll tell you, when people walked into that room, whether they were visiting him or someone else, when nurses came in that room, there was a bush that was burning. If you looked at Germain's face, his face would have a smile. There was such joy. People were coming to Christ at his bedside. Why? Because there was a bush burning that did not burn up. There was something different, and it wasn't Germain that got the attention. It was the God of Sherman, the hope he had, the joy he had, even in the face of death. I remember another burning bush when I lived in uh, Niger, North Africa. There was this one day in, in January of 2015 where um, some extremists came to burn down every church building in the entire country within 24 hours, and it was in response to this Charlie Hebdo comic in France. And anyway, long story short, it created a lot of chaotic situations in the country in which I was living. And uh, and anyway, they came. They burned down almost every almost every church building. They came to burn down my house, in fact, and and some of my uh, Muslim neighbors and, and and one of my uh, my Christian buddies. They actually stood in front of the gates and said, "Just uh, he's not even here right now, you know." And so they said, "Okay, we'll come back later." Um, and and they didn't. So my house actually stood that day. But um, after everything was done, I was sitting down with one pastor who's. Um, Whose uh, the local church where he worked had been the building had been burned down. The church is will not be burned because huh? uh, the church only thrives in the face of persecution. So let's make sure we get our 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 language correct in this story. But the the building was burned down, and actually it was interesting as I talked to various pastors. They just said, "Oh, we're so thankful that." that uh, the local church we go to was burned down. I said, well, you know, why? He said, just think about what a shame it would be if we weren't counted worthy to suffer for the gospel. But anyway, I was talking to this one, this one pastor, and uh, he said, yeah, they were breaking down our door. We had, uh, we had the gate locked, and, and right before they broke into the compound, I was passing my children over the wall to safety um, before the mobs arrived. And I asked him, I said, what were you thinking? What were you thinking as you passed your children over the wall and you knew that soon your lively, your, your, your house, um, the building where you work, would all be burned down and destroyed? And he said, you know, Nathan, all I could think about was how much I love those people who were about to break into our compound, how much I love them, and how much I want them to know the love of Jesus. You know, you hear that story and you say, wow, there's a bush burning. There's a bush burning, and I need to take a closer look. Where does that joy come from? Where does that peace come from? Where does that love for your enemies come from? And of course, it points us back to the voice, the voice in the bush. And of course, that's the Lord Jesus, the Word of God. And, and so we see these burning bushes. I'll, I'll tell you about another burning bush that, um, that, that caught my attention, and it's very significant that I, I share this with you, and you're going to see in a minute just why. But um, a dear brother of mine, uh, a, a man named Bob, and Bob got diagnosed with uh, stage four cancer back in 2017. And Bob was a dear guy. I was preaching um, on the island where he uh, where he ministered in Hawaii. And you're probably thinking like a tourist island. It's actually a very rural area, um, not not very touristy whatsoever. In fact, while I was there, he said, "Hey, is there just uh, anything in Hawaii that like you want to do that you haven't been able to do?" I said, "I'd love to learn to surf." So Bob took me to surf. Well, it was a year later, I believe, um, that he was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. He was given three to six months to live. And after his um, diagnosis of three to six months to live, he posted uh, something on Facebook because he was just so joyful and excited. And people were constantly asking him, how can you be so full of joy in the midst of aggressive cancer? So he gave a top 10 countdown list. Now, I'm not going to give you all top 10, but he shared, how can I not be excited when the grace of God, the strength of Christ, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is mine? Another point he made was the love, friendship, prayers of the saints. Um, another another aspect of, of being so full of joy in cancer was the biblical view of lordship and submission to Christ that it's all about him. Uh, one of his points, which really touched me, was the joyful expectation of receiving new bodies 
finally free from this body of death. Uh, I'll share a couple more with you. He said, um, the rich reward awaiting the saints, it's going to be worth it all. And one other one, he said, the long engagement will culminate in union with Jesus Christ wedding day. This guy was just exuding a passion for Jesus and couldn't wait to go be with him, but also enjoyed living. In fact, his conclusion was, what is there not to be joyful about in cancer? I'm in an enviable win-win situation. If I die from cancer, I win because everything I've longed for as a follower of Christ will be consummated. And if I survive cancer, I win because it'll mean fruitful labor and hopefully continued progress and joy in the faith for those around me. What a wonderful dilemma. What a loving God. What an epic life. Well, he made a huge impact on me because it was one year later that I was diagnosed with cancer. And I just immediately remembered the burning bush I saw that didn't burn up, Bob. And I thought, wow, the Lord has given me the gift of cancer now. And I can say genuinely from the very first minute that I got the call in Wichita, Kansas, from the doctor saying, Nathan, you have cancer. It was exciting. It was a gift that the Lord allowed me to have so that I could proclaim his name. But I'll tell you, I'm not saying that there's no boasting on my side. I'm saying the Lord allowed Bob to be a catalyst to change my heart. He was a burning bush where I had to take a closer glance. And in taking a closer glance, I saw the beauty of God's word and the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Well, I told you there was a something special about this story, and that is today, as I knew I was going to share it, I hadn't heard from Bob in, in, a, in a little while. And so I went to his Facebook page. And as soon as I clicked on his Facebook page, I saw it wasn't his normal page. It was a memorial page. And sure enough, my dear friend Bob, he went far longer than three to six months, but um, after about four, four and a half years of battling this cancer, my dear brother Bob is now in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, but that burning bush, that burning bush of example continues to burn. And it's examples like that that we can rejoice in. Oh, I remember one more story about Bob before I, 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 I just move on to a conclusion here. And that is that before his diagnosis, he was getting one of his scans. He knew it was serious. He, he knew it, it, was, um, it, it was stage four, just didn't know to what degree. And he, was, he, he told us that he was in a room with um, CEOs of companies, high school students, business owners, um, philanthropists, uh, nuclear power technicians, insurance uh, investigators, retirees, restaurant owners, engineers, and it was all men because of the form of cancer he had. And he was in this room with all these guys, some who had received a terminal diagnosis and others who didn't know yet what, what the doctors were going to say. And um, it's just a somber setting, all quiet. And Bob just thought, man, I'm like, a, I'm like a kid in a candy store here. All these ones, they need hope. And I've got hope. So he started sharing one by one the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ in that waiting room. Every time the nurse would come in, he would just pray, Lord, don't let it be me who's next to go get that scan. I haven't talked to that guy. I haven't talked to that guy. And the Lord allowed him to talk to every single person in that room and just be a, a disseminator of hope. Oh, what a glorious gospel we have to share. And so these burning bushes that we see, are we taking time to step aside when we see something which says that doesn't line up with the world's way of thinking? Why? Because there's something eternal. We don't look at the things we see, but the things we don't see because the things you see are temporary. The things you don't see are eternal. Second Corinthians 4, 18. Well, as I close, there's just a couple more comments uh, I'd like to make on these burning bushes. Um, and, and specifically, the burning bush really could picture a, a few different things. Some people like to say the burning bush um, is a symbol of the nation of Israel. I, I'm, I'm not going to go there, but what they would say is despite the fire of affliction that the Hebrews went through, they weren't consumed. Um, and even though the fire came from a place of thorns, da, 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 okay, that's great. Um, sure, I, I can see the elements there. But um, anyway, I just want to let you know that's one way of thought. Another would say it's a symbol of the believer. Like Jim Elliott said, am I ignitable? God, deliver me from the dread asbestos of other things. Saturate me with the oil of your spirit that I may be a flame. And I, I think there's definitely that. And that's what we just talked about. Burning bushes that we see constantly in other people's lives. And Jim Elliott was a great example of that 
along with the other four who were martyred um, on the on the shores of the jungle in in Ecuador. And so, yeah, it's great that we might be ignitable, that we might be that bush from which people hear the voice of the Lord, where they see his goodness. But I do think that there is a much more solid picture that we can rest on as we conclude this episode, and that is that we can see Jesus in the burning bush. See, the burning bush is really a picture of the cross. Uh, again, remember the Hebrew word to describe this type of bush. It, it's, it, it comes from a thorn bush, a bramble. And, and how can we not think of the cross, a place where Jesus was crowned with thorns, where he endured the fires of, of ultimately God's judgment that we deserved. And why? Well, he endured it on our behalf. You see, if we really want to take a step back here in Exodus chapter 3, it was the cross. It was the cross that attracted Moses. He had to come in for this closer examination. And I don't want to stretch this too far, but in a very real way, what we see here is a parallel to a conversion story. See, this was his intersection with uh, the cross. And and what I mean by that is God's holiness and man's sinfulness intersected. We see that a little later on when we're going to get down to take off your sandals. Well, why? Because it's holy ground. You see, God's holiness. But who was Moses? Who am I? He's going to say, that later on. What is my mouth? I can't speak. But the point being is not who Moses was, but who God is. But typically, if God's holiness intersects man's sinfulness, what is the result? Well, it's to be judgment. It's to be condemnation. But that's not what we see here. See, instead, we see a turning point. It's like in Isaiah 6, when the prophet finds himself in the throne room of God, and the the seraphim are singing, holy, 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 or, or calling out, holy, holy, holy. But Hang on. What do they do? They take a coal from the fire and it cut from the altar and it comes towards Isaiah and it should be condemnation, but instead of condemnation, it's cleansing. It's joy instead of judgment. It's a calling instead of being consumed. And and this is what we see. We see a turning point in Moses' life. I think of Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Oh, how can the Lord reveal himself, even like this, without being, let's say, a consuming God of of Moses, consuming Moses because he's a sinner, or, or consuming us in our sinful state. And of course, the answer is in Romans 5 verse 21, that as sin has reigned to death, even so might grace reign through righteousness to eternal life. Of course, how? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh, the answer is the grace of God. See, Galatians 3.13 tells us Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And what was the symbol of that curse back in Genesis chapter 3? It was thorns. That was one aspect of it, thorns. Um, so I just rejoice as I read this passage in Exodus chapter 3 to see the cross of Jesus, to see this point of recognizing that, wow, Despite God's holiness and man's sinfulness, he has made a way. And uh, just the, the parallel is hard to miss, too. If you just line up Abraham, Moses, and Jesus in all three stories from Genesis 22 to Exodus chapter 3 to, to the, the account of the cross, what do we see? We see thorns. We see a ram caught in thorns with Abraham. We see the bush with thorns here with Moses. And, of course, we see a head crowned with thorns in the Lord Jesus. In all three cases, and we'll look into this more next time, we see the names repeated. We see Abraham, Abraham a call from heaven. Here we see a call from the bush, Moses, Moses, and yet at the cross, we see the call from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Abraham's case, Isaac was not consumed. In Moses' case, Moses was not consumed, or I should say, the bush was not consumed. But in the case of Jesus, we are the ones who were not consumed. In Abraham's story, the fire, uh, there was a fire of the altar. In Moses, there was the fire of the bush. But in Jesus' case, there was the fire of God's judgment. And it all happened significantly on, on a mountain, on Mount Moriah, on Mount Horeb, and finally on Mount Calvary. Oh, all of these pictures point us so clearly to the fact that we 
we are part of the greatest story, the ultimate story. All of these point to something more, and that something more is where God dealt with our sin. See, how can a holy God even work with sinful creation except sinful creation? Well, it's only because sin was dealt with in the person of Jesus Christ, because there is an ultimate solution to our fallen state. And so we praise God that we have hope wherever, whenever you're listening to this, whether it be morning, night, or uh, sometime in between. So we're going to discuss this all more in episodes to come. But for now, I want to just ask you these questions of what burning bushes are happening around you? And God is saying, take a closer look. Get alone. Be alone, but be alert. And as you do that, we're well on our way to this journey of hearing clearly, listening to the voice of God in a loud world. For now, our time is up, so please check out www.intoyourbible.org for more information, for show notes, so you can check out our YouTube page for other videos. Um, But there's resources to download. Use them if they could be a blessing to you. Share this with others who you think might might be blessed by listening to it. Um, But most of all, remember that this has been Into Your Bible, and this is a place where we pray you would be one who loves the Word of God and the God of the Word.